Hey, Scott. Uh, congrats on another great event. Let's talk about the main event first. Uh, Musasi defeating welterweight champion Lima for the middleweight belt. What did you think of his performance and uh, Lima's performance as well? I mean, I think you saw a real tactical fight. And uh, there are some bombs being thrown out there. I mean, let's face it. You saw Gegard leaving here. He's in a lot of pain. He took a lot of shots. And Lima took a lot of shots. Uh, and I think it was a, a tactical fight. At times, they really engaged and threw some bombs, especially when Gegar took him down in the first round, started throwing those elbows. I know he was trying to cut him and, and you know, hurt him on the ground, but, uh, you know, Lima, Lima was able to weather the storm. Um, but Gegar did tell me one thing. He said, when I started elbowing him and I knew that I couldn't hurt him, he goes, I, I knew it was going to be a long night. What did you think of Douglas at 185? I know but coming into the fight, you said that, you thought that the size would be a little different than the Rory McDonald fight against uh, Musasi. What did you think when you saw him in there tonight? You know what? I'll tell you. Um, I, I actually thought he handled the, the weight well. And uh, Gegard versus Rory was a much different fight, as you know. I mean, he just destroyed Rory. Gegard versus Lima was a tactical war. Lima was looking for that big counterpunch. In my opinion, that's how he kind of had the fight going with that, trying to get that left hook in there. And... Um, you know, he just, it was just Gegard's night, but they, I'm sure both of them are, are not going to be in good spirits tonight and uh, dealing with a lot of pain. And, you know, it's just, it was, to me, it was a, a great main event. Both before and during, uh, excuse me, both before and after this fight, Musasi said that John Salter would probably be the next one in line for him. Do you agree with that assessment? You know, again, this is something that, you know, a lot of times when we get asked these questions uh, after the fight, I'd like to take it back to my guys uh, back in the Bay area and, and uh, you know, we'll evaluate and see who's next for, for Gegard. But um, you know, there's a couple of people that I have in mind and, and same thing for Douglas Lima. He's still our 170 pound pound champ and, and uh, we're going to have some good fights for him as well. I know the MVP wants to fight him again. I think of Neiman Gracie right off the top of my head. And so we, we're going to put him in some good fights and we're going to let him heal up, rest up with these guys because they're going to be banged up for a while. And, uh, you know, sometime next year, we'll put him back into the cage. Jake Hager uh, making his return tonight. Definitely the toughest opponent that he's faced, the toughest challenge. Um, pretty exciting fight, though. What did you think of his performance and uh, his ability to, to take some damage and still win? You know what? I was actually impressed. And, and I'll tell you why. Because he doesn't need to do this. Jake Hager does not need to be an MMA fighter and fighting in the cage. Just something he wants to do. And, uh, and, and he's still, you know, relatively young in his career, right? Because he's only had what, two or three fights, something like that. Um, and so to me, I give him a lot of respect and he was in a, he was in a fight tonight. Right. So, you know, he had to, he had to, you know, get that dug out in him and, 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 and finish this fight and, and keep fighting. Cause he was caught. I think it was the second round. He got caught. And then he weathered the storm. He came back and he started throwing some good right hands. He got cut up pretty bad. I think he has an eye injury. It's like, you know, he was in a fight. He was in a dog fight today. So, you know, all those people out there that, you know, are, you know, giving him bad time. Look, for a, a guy with that kind of experience, um, we saw what he was made up tonight, which I was really impressed. So, you know, I, I would give him a, a good report card for his effort and his performance. Um, and, you know, I would say to people just – you know, don't be so tough because, like I said, this guy's just a beginner. You know, he's only had a few fights. And I think uh, this this card for the first time since you guys have been back have had they had a or excuse me, you guys had a couple of cancellations. Mm -hmm. um, later on, it came out that they were COVID positive COVID tests. So, can you shed any light on that? Is there anything you need? You guys think you need to do differently going forward, or is it just something that's that's going to happen these days? Well, you know what? It's look. This is this is um, this is the new normal, right? Um, we test throughout the week, and if they flunk a test sometime from the time they get here and test until the last test, uh, which is Wednesday, uh, oh, actually, I'm sorry, Tuesday, and results come back on Wednesday, uh, then they're not qualified to fight anymore. That's just how the rule is. So to me, it's, it's unfortunate, uh, but safety first. And, you know, I think that now that they've been informed and, they, and the athletes have been told this is what happened, I think that are actually, you know, going to step two, which is like, oh, I better go take care of this and I better quarantine. I better, you know, make sure that no one's around me. And, you know, like I'm thinking that you're going to preventive mode now. So I think that there's an initial shock originally, but, you know, this is not 
just in MMA. This is not just at, uh, here at Bellator. It's in the NFL. It's in Major League Baseball, like you saw the Dodgers in the World Series. It's like it's in uh, in every sport. So to me, I think we do a great job. We have a great bubble here. And um, if the fighter tests along the way, then then they, then they can't fight. That's just the rules. All right, we'll take a few questions from the media joining us virtually tonight. John Carlo. Hi, Scott. Uh, Henry Kalalis, uh, after his win tonight, he was talking about Juan Archuleta and wanting to move down to challenge him for the title. Is that a fight that you're uh, interested in entertaining? Wow, you know, that's the first I've heard that he wanted to go down to 35. But uh, if he really wants to do it, we should have a conversation. That's a tough kid right there. He was, he was under fire, and he was very calm and very composed. It's probably the best I've seen Henry look uh, since the time that we've signed him. So, um, you know, at 35, we got Juan. We have Patrick Mix. We have uh, uh, some new athletes, Magomedov. Uh, we got, um, you know, uh, Horiguchi that probably will come and fight for us at some point. I mean, we got a, we got a great 135-pound weight class. And uh, if, if Henry wants to go down there, I think it would just be another addition uh, just to strengthen up that division. So he, he'll be welcome to come down there and fight at 35 if he wishes. Santiago. Hi, Scott. Greetings from Amsterdam and con congratulations on a beautiful night of fights again. Next week, Melvin Manhoof is going to fight in the main event against Corey Anderson. Manfield, Melvin will be the fourth Dutch main event fighter in the last five weeks. How proud are you of the Dutch force on your Bellator roster? Oh, uh, listen. You know, everybody knows the Dutch can bring it. And uh, this goes way back even to the K-1 days. It was the Dutch that were, they were, there was winning everything. Ernesto Hoos was winning three, four times. Peter Arts winning all the time. I mean, you know, uh, Sammy Schiltz, Remy Bonjeski, you know, I'm talking about kickboxing, of course. But uh, there is such a great tradition of martial arts combat in, in uh, the Netherlands and, uh, you know, I just think the fighters are going to keep coming and keep getting better and better. And, uh, you know, very proud to have them on our cards. Donna? Hi, Scott. Uh, I wanted to ask you about, uh, you know, you, you've had some fighters this week. We spoke to Jake Hager at the media day. Obviously, he didn't come back today because he went to the hospital. But at the media day, he was open talking about his support of, uh, of the president. We had another fighter come in today and, and wear his, his Trump hat. Uh, of course, in the other promotion, the promoter likes to talk about politics a lot. He's very vocal about who he supports. You try to kind of stay apolitical a lot of the time. It's, a, of course, a big week in, in American politics. What's your stance on your fighters coming out and making these big political statements using your platform? You know, I think that, you know, listen, we, we let the fighters have their own sponsors. We let the fighters express themselves as long as it's, you know, within guidelines of something that is, you know, uh, done properly, let's say, and not cross the line a little bit. This is a very uh, touchy subject because of the politics and where this country is at right now. But um, really, I feel like if, if, you know, they have the, you know, the desire to have that uh, be on their shorts or be on their, their uh, banner, I mean, that's really, really up to them. Jay? Thanks very much. Uh, Scott, congrats on the event tonight. Um, Gigard said after the fight, he doesn't necessarily care about having two titles, but if the opportunity was given to him, he'd take it. I guess that kind of leaves it up to the promotion. Is that something you'd be interested in seeing him doing? Absolutely. I mean, when we signed Gigard, uh, he had a desire to fight at 205 as well. So, you know, we're going to explore that. We have some great fights for him at 205. Uh, I still think we have the best 205 weight pound weight class fighters in the in the world we have uh uh i think six seven eight deep uh including uh corey anderson who's gonna fight melvin uh, next week on thursday so uh you know to me it's uh it's something that i i think that he should do and he should go try it out and check it out but it's really gonna be up to him and see how he feels but uh Gegard fighting at 205 you know i see him fighting ryan bader you know i see him fighting maybe corey anderson or i see him you know i mean there's there's a lot of guys even even um fighting Nemkov at some point. Um, if he wants to go for the belt, you know, we can have that conversation. But we just haven't had it yet. He's been focusing on this fight. And now that it's over, I'm going to let him rest up and then we'll have some conversations. Darren? Thanks so much for having me and congratulations on another great event. Scott, question coming out of nowhere here, but Mohegan Sun's one of my favorite places to go, period. But what is it that brings Bellator there so regularly? Well, we've been set up here for the last, what I want to say since mid-July 
So uh, we're going to be here to the end of the year. Um, and, you know, we've had a great relationship with the hotel before we entered uh, into this bubble. Um, but uh, with COVID hitting and knowing that we're going to go into an isolated situation, create our own bubble, uh, we felt that this was the place to come. And they were very good partners. And we, want, we actually wanted to come here and, and uh, have our fights here. And we took over the arena and Showtime is doing boxing here uh, for the, for the most part. And we're doing our MMA here. So it's been a, it's been a good relationship between Showtime, Bellator and the Mohegan Sun. We have time for one or two more, Sean. Uh, Scott, again, congratulations on a great event. Obviously you had just announced uh, for the women's uh, flyweight title, Ilime Lay McFarlane against uh, Juliana Velasquez is going to be an exciting fight. I mean, obviously you would love to hold that, in Hawaii, a packed crowd there in uh, Lima's hometown, you know, home country. With that aside, this is still a huge international fight. So just talk about the, the ramifications, you know, internationally, you're looking to draw huge numbers. Listen, uh, Juliana Velasquez is a tough, tough fighter. She will be the toughest test for Alima McFarland to date. And Alima's fought some tough girls and uh, she's done very well, but this will be her toughest te uh, test to date. Uh, we're expecting a, a war. I think that, uh, you know, the champ, Alima, is training. She's getting ready. I think mentally she's preparing herself, and she's ready for this task. And for Velasquez, this is her dream. This is something she's always wanted to do is win the belt, and she's coming here, and she's going to, you know, try her best to, you know, to fight Alima and take the belt home. So to me, it's going to be a war. This is something that you have two undefeated fighters, very rarely does that happen in this sport at the highest level, like it is right here, having a world title fight. So to me, this is a fight I'm really looking forward to. Everybody should put this down in their uh, calendar because it's going to be it's going to be fireworks on uh, December 10th. Last question, John. Hi, Scott. I wanted to ask you about Cody Law. He made his pro debut today, and he uh, picked up the first round submission. Just your thoughts on uh, his performance and where you see him in the future. Yeah, you know what? Unfortunately, I uh, did not see that fight. I was on my way down here, so I missed it. But um, um, if you want, we can arrange a, uh, a, co a conversation with you and Rich, and he can explain to you uh, how he feels about Cody. Hey, Scott. We'll take, uh, uh, one last question here from Kevin. Kevin, go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks. Uh, uh, one big question I have for me is uh, recently uh, it was released that there's been a, re a big influx of retirements and releases from the Bellator roster. Any comment on that? You know what? Um, I think if you if you uh, factor in the amount of months that we haven't cut anybody or change our roster over, it's been about three athletes a month that have gone out to three athletes that have come in. We try to manage our roster right below 300, and that's kind of where we feel comfortable. Um, and so that that's a goal. But it just seems like a lot because it happened all at once. But really, we haven't you know had this conversation with fighters and change our roster and, and actually cut fighters uh, for since probably, you know, January or February. So it's been a long time. And, and to me, it's like, look, we got a lot of new fighters that we're signing and a lot of blue chip prospects we brought in. We had to make room for those guys. And so, like I said uh, earlier, one, some of the fighters retired, some of the fighters uh, contracts expired and, um, you know, we, we need to make room. So that's, that's what the nature of that is, is that, you know, we're going to, we're going to have new fighters coming in fighters going out, but really if you average it over the last, you know, 10 months, it's, it's really like three, three a month. So it just happened all at once. That's just the way it went down, but uh, it's not something that is as drastic as it appears. Thanks Scott. Thank you.